Hi, uh, so just some quick words about me. I uh, started using Python in 2011, then two years later started using PyQt and working on Q browser, which Kristen already mentioned, mentioned quickly. I switched to the PyTest testing frameworks in 2015, somehow I ended up as a maintainer of it in the same year. In 2017, I released Cube Browser version 1.0, which uses Qt Web Engine by default, but you can still switch between Qt WebKit or Qt Web Engine backend. And now I'm part-time employed at the University of Applied Science, helping people understand C and Assembler and writing loads of LaTeX code. <laughs> and the other part of my time, I'm working on open source and doing some freelancing with a one-man company called Bruhin Software, and also giving trainings around PyQt, PyTest, and Python. So following that pattern, something interesting will probably happen in 2021. I don't know what yet. So this talk will kind of be piece of piece, Python, PyQt, and then PyTest, and then how they all three work together. Um, could we do a quick show of hands? Who in the audience writes more Python than C++? That's a third, maybe? Cool. Um, so I'll just quickly go over the Python features, which might be a bit unique to Python, uh, which are relevant for this talk. Python has decorators, which let you decorate the function, like with the add register, uh, which is highlighted. And that decorator gets a function object and then can do with that whatever it wants. So in this example, it just adds it to a list register functions and returns it unmodified. Uh, by the way, I added type annotations to my code so people writing C++ maybe feel a little bit more at home. Then Python has context managers which is a way to introduce your own block syntax. It's quite commonly used with the open built-in, where you can open a file, and when the block ends, it will be closed properly, even if there is an exception in that block. But you can also define your own objects by just giving them special enter and exit methods. And whatever you return from the enter method can then be used um, in the block, like here with the S, F syntax. So open returns a file object, and that gets assigned to the name F. The last feature I want to show are generators, which is the yield keyword in Python. Uh, what that do, does is, it's basically something like return, but it gives you a generator which lazily generates those objects. So if you just print it, you just get something, yeah, it's a generator object. And then if you convert it to a list, you get the actual values. And PyTest, as we will see later, uses that just as a means to run a part of a function before the yield and then resume the function and the part after the yield at a later point in time. So just a very quick look at how Python and Qt cooperate. I assume most of you have already seen this from previous talks. There are two big bindings. One of them is PyQt, started over 20 years ago, which I find quite remarkable, so in Qt two or three times, by Riverbank Computing. Uh, it's GPL licensed or commercial, which in my opinion is kind of the biggest difference to PySide or Qt for Python. And it's mostly uh, Qt, there's Qt 4 and Qt 5, and PyQt 4, PyQt 5. You could mix them, like you could use PyQt 5 with Qt 4, but nobody really does that, so why bother? Then there is PySide, which is also quite old, also was unmaintained for a quite long time, like Qt 5 came ar uh, around, but there wasn't any way to use PySide with it. But now it's thankfully maintained again by the Qt company. There was a release in 2018, and it's uh, LGPL licensed, and also much more community focused than PyQt is, because PyQt is basically a one-man show. 
just to show a quick example how that code would look, but I assume you have probably seen something like this before, and it's also quite similar to what you would see in C++, with maybe a little bit less fluff or special syntax. So let's take a look at PyTest. Uh, was in a talk about QTest today, and it was mentioned that it has quite a bit of magic in it, and I would agree. I mean, I haven't used it that much, but yeah. PyTest is kind of the same. It has a bit of weird magic in it, but in the end, it's, it works out really well if, as soon as you get used to it. So why would you use PyTest? Let's say we have a very simple function. It takes an integer and just returns that plus two. Now, with the standard unit test.py library, which comes with the Python standard library, that's how a test uh, would look. But everything except that uh, highlighted line is just basically boilerplate. So, in my opinion, that looks like Java, kind of, not like Python. And actually, it's inspired by the Java test API, I think. In PyTest, the test looks like this. And this quite nicely shows one of the philosophies behind PyTest. The best API is no API, because things get a lot simpler then. Now, if you know how the search statement works in Python or even in C++, you might say, but wait, how am I going to get information about the failure? All I would get normally is an assertion error without any information about what's wrong. But that's where the magic comes in, because PyTest does some rewriting of the source code, or of the AST rather, and tries to give you as much and as, as accurate information as possible, so it can see what your issue is as, as fast as possible. Ideally, without debugging stuff. So, in this example, where we just compare two strings, where one has a comma, the other has, uh, do doesn't, it gives us a diff and says, hey, that's your problem right here. Another nice feature which PyTest gives you is parameterizing of tests. That's quite similar to the data driven tests with QFetch in, in the QTest API. But again, in my opinion, which with a much more lightweight and simple syntax, which probably just isn't possible in C++. Now, one quite unique feature in PyTest are fixtures. A fixture is a means to separate setup and teardown code from the actual test, so your tests can, can be focused on testing, and everything which is about setting up objects or cleaning uh, things up are moved into those fixtures. Those fixtures work by defining a fixture function like answer here, which returns some object and is decorated with that PyTest fixture decorator. And the test function can then request that fixture by having an argument with the same name. So what PyTest does here is dependency injection it automatically sets up your objects based on the, on the argument name answer and the fixture named answer. And that, that allows you to separate setup and teardown from your tests. You can also combine those fixtures. For example, you could have a fixture half returning 21, then a fixture answer returning 42, which uses half, and then the test. Now, of course, this example is kind of silly, but if you have some kind of GUI object, let's say you, you have some kind of line edit or whatever, you could have a fixture for that. And then if you need something more complex, you could also have another fixture which uses that, which we'll see in a minute. Using that yield keyword, fixtures also allows you to do teardown. For example, you could have, could have a database fixture which gets some kind of database object, connects. Then with the yield keyword, it, that's the point where the test runs and the test can also get that database object. And whenever a test is finished, for example, it would roll back the database. So let's take a look at how all those three things 
fall together. PyTest supports plugins, and there is a PyTest Qt plugin. Uh, it supports pretty much anything you'd, uh, you'd want it to. So PyQt4, PyQt5, PySide, PySide2, Qt4 Python, which is the same as PySide2. Um, the main interaction is with one of those fixtures called QtBot. I might, or I should have uh, inserted a picture of a cute robot, probably. <laughs> so let's take a look at a very basic example. We have a fixture again called label, which uses that cute bot fixture and sets up a label which we want to test later. What it also does is calling cute bot add widget, which is just a way to register widgets and QtBot will then take care of, of, teardown, of, of cleanup. So it will make sure all your widgets are closed again after a test. And it will also allow you to, for example, stop the test and inspect it manually if you're debugging something. So let's take a look at what other features PyTest Qt can give you. One quite tricky thing about those bindings in general is if it, is exception handling. If you have a Python exception in a virtual C++ method, what are you going to do? Because to handle the Python exception, you need to get back to Python land, but you're in C++ land. So either you can return some default constructed value, like zero or, or null pointer or whatever to C++, and lock the exception somewhere, which is what PyQ used to do for a long time until I complained about it, because it introduces kind of undefined behavior. Or you can call the abort low-level um, function and kill the whole process. Now, I'd argue usually when developing, the second makes a lot of sense, because you shouldn't have any unhandled exceptions in, in your code. But when testing, it's kind of painful, because then you never see your test results. Your test suit just aborts somewhere in the middle. So that's, that's not really useful. So what the plugin does is handling those exceptions in a way that it fails the tests, which had an exception, and you also see the stack trace and all. Another thing it does is uh, handling logging capture. PyTest already has capturing built in for um, standard output and the Python logging system. So you can log or even print things in your tests and PyTest will capture it. So it will hide all out outputs because usually you're not interested in all that outputs in your test suite. And if a test fails, it will just show you the outputs produced by the failing test and nothing else. The plugin does the same for cute warnings. So if you have some function emitting a cute warning or calling queue warning and a test which fails, for example, by just calling assert false here, then the plugin will show us a section in the output with captured cute messages and whatever happened there. You can also access those messages programmatically with the cute log fixture. So if you want to test if something logs some queue warning, for example, you could do it like this. So you just get a list of logging records, uh, which, for example, have a type and a message, which you can then check. Or depending on, on what your needs are, you could also configure your um, the plugin to fail your test suite as soon as an unexpected warning, for example, is emitted. Or fail your test, rather, not the test suite. It also provides you with queue test integration. So all the, the queue test utility methods like mouse click uh, or key press or whatever are just available and wrapped through uh, with that queue bot fixture. And in some cases, it also exposes uh, an API, which is a little bit nicer. So for example, for weight exposed, you get a context manager again, which just actually waits for that exposed event when the, that width block is over. 
but it allows you to to make your tests much more readable because whatever is ca is causing that window to appear, for example, that splash screen to appear, you can indent that code into that block, which, in my opinion, makes things much more readable. So uh, now we will look at some other ways uh, on how to wait for things because that is something you need to do a lot when testing asynchronous code like with Qt. Of course, you can wait for signals, similarly to a queue signal spy, but again, with a little bit a nicer API. You have a context manager wait signal. You give it whatever signal you want to wait for, and optionally a timeout, where it would fail your test when the signal isn't, isn't emitted by then. And then, for example, start a worker. And then internally, the plugin just spins the Qt uh, event loop and waits for that signal to appear. And if it doesn't, it fails your test. Like here. You can also check uh, what arguments the signal was emitted uh, with by again capturing that that block or that signal blocker object you get from the context manager, and then checking, for example, the arguments. Quite similarly, you can also wait for multiple signals by just using wait signals instead of wait signal and giving it a list of signals. Say if you expect a success and a finished signal. Or you can say, I don't want the signal to be emitted. For example, if you have some error signal and you're running some code and saying, hey, when I run this, there no error signal should be emitted. You can wait for conditionals. Let's say you have some status bar and you know at some point in your test that status bar text will change, but you don't really have a signal to wait for and you don't want to introduce one just for testing. So instead you have some condition like, like this check label function and call wait until and then it will just call that function every couple of milliseconds or so and as soon as it doesn't fail anymore, so as soon as your test, uh, as the text changed, for example, uh, your test continues. Finally, you can wait for callbacks, which can be quite nice for testing, especially Qt Web Engine code, which is heavily callback based. So, for example, you have a Q Web Engine page and you want to run some JavaScript in it, and then you get a, a special callback object uh, by the wait callback. Uh, context manager, which then can be given to wherever you need it. And again, you can use that then to, to check your arguments. The pretty much final thing I want to show you is the Qt model tester. It's been a part of, of Qt internally, used to test Qt itself for a quite long time. and. In Qt 5.11 or so, it was exposed to via the Qt test. So if you're writing C++ code, you can use Qt's model tester to test your models. And it will do a lot of checks for your custom um, Q abstract item models, like checking if types are correct, checking if, if index, uh, indexes are correct, you don't have any off by one errors. And what the plugin does, it can either use the C++ version via bindings, if available, or it can use a Python re-implementation of the same checks, which I try to keep up to date with Qt's changes, because they also, if you use the Python version, you also get nicer output again, because PyTest can, can do what it does. So what you would do is just, you, you have some model. Here I have a model which just returns an, an object instance which is an invalid type for whatever data role you get, and run the model tester on it. And what happens is that I, in this case, get the output of the C++ model tester, and the test fails. 
And I personally found that really useful when writing custom models because without something like that, you just get a lot of segmentation faults and have no idea what's going on. There are also a lot of other plugins. Actually, when I, when I did those slides, uh, I wrote 700. I just checked again today and it's over 750. So pretty much whatever you need to do, there is a plugin for it. There's a plugin for emoji outputs. There is a plugin which allows you to make mark tests as bad and you get a, a pile of poo emoji for them. <laughs> There's a plugin for <coughs> HTML output, of course. Um, here I show some which I found useful myself, especially for, for GUI testing. Uh, there's also Hypothesis, which is kind of a property-based testing, like a fuzzer, which I'd really recommend for testing Python code in general. And yeah, whatever else you need, you will find a plugin, or if you don't, it's very easy to write one yourself. So if you want to take a look at, at my small one-line company or at the slides, there is a QR code here. At the bottom of the website, you will find a link to the slides. Uh, as I said, I do trainings, uh, custom development, consulting all around PyTest, PyCute. So if you're interested in that, let's talk. I also do have PyTest stickers if you're interested. So yeah, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Yeah, in general, you need some kind of graphical output. So yeah, you could use that um, that PyTest XVFB uh, plugin, which I wrote for exactly that reason, testing stuff on CI, which gives you a virtual X server on Linux. Um, depending on what you're doing, you could also use the minimal or off-screen platform plugins where I can tell Qt, hey, I don't want to, you to render anything, just do it in memory, basically. Um, my experience with those were that it sometimes breaks tests in, in weird ways, so I prefer to use XVFB. Thank you.